Good morning. This morning's scripture reading will be Psalms 133. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Thank you, Phil. Well, hopefully you're all stuffed. Lots of good things going on. Lots of good things going on with our church as well, and because we are a family in Christ, and that's always good. So the adopt a family, just to know how that all started, we've tried various ways to figure out how to reach some of the poorer people in our neighborhood, and we do have some poorer people in our neighborhood, but to just say, oh, let's give away something, doesn't always get to the poorer people in our neighborhood. And so what we have done is teamed up with Lowell Elementary School because they see the kids that come in. They work with the families that come in. And so they have picked four families that are the poorest who will not have Christmas. And they have been gracious enough to give us the names along with the sizes and the requests of what they want. You know, that's always the hardest part of any gift giving is, well, what do you want this year? I don't know. Okay, you're left. Well, you don't have to do that with this. It has a very specific request of exactly what they want, and so that's always better and easier. And if you don't want to get that one, get a different tag. You don't have to take that tag. Get a different tag. Get the one you want to get. But all of this will go toward some families that are very poor, some families that are very needy, and so... Uh, a Wednesday night closer to Christmas, we will all come together and we will go in groups and, and go to the family's house and give them the gifts that they know are coming. Uh, and so that's going to be a very good thing for us to be able to do. And so uh, be sure and see Joanna render her check because that's a great thing. New quarter begins next week. So if you come and your class is no longer there, just... Realize it may have moved. Uh, there may be uh, another person teaching this time, and so I know you've got a, a section of the bulletin that describes all the classes that will be going on for next quarter. All right, so we want to talk a little bit about uncommon unity. And what does that mean? What does that look like? And so just so that you'll know what... Uh, unity is like and the reason why we would have unity I have this clip for you So unity is one of those things that we desperately need for protection, for one thing. Uh, it just shows you what happens if we're left by ourselves, but it also shows us what blessings there are when we can join with other people. 
Uh, it's always one of those things that's best for us. It's one of those things that makes us part of something bigger than we could ever accomplish by ourselves. It uh, is where we're able to take care of each other. It gives us a common goal, a way of dealing with bigger issues in our life. And so unity is, is everywhere recognized as something that is really great. It is especially good because God's the one that invented it. And it is especially good when it's because of God. And so I want to go back to the passage that Phil read to us. And, you know, maybe it doesn't quite give us the, the warm, fuzzy feeling because it's talking about things we're not familiar with. I mean, oil on your head that runs down on your beard. I'm sorry that most of you people don't know how good that is. But... Uh, it's a great thing to have oil on your beard. Well, that's not really the reason why. But he says, it's good and pleasant when brothers dwell together in unity. And so that's his main point. And then here's the illustration of that. It's like oil on the beard of Aaron that runs down. Well, the oil that they used for the beard of Aaron was a very special oil. It was only one time that they could make it, only one way that they could make it, and it was used for nothing else. God patented the recipe. And he says, you will not use this oil for anything else except to anoint all of the things within my tabernacle and to anoint Aaron, because that oil was the connection. It was the recognition. It was the way that, that God said, this is what I recognize as being holy. And when Aaron is anointed with this oil, it makes Aaron holy. And Aaron is the high priest that speaks for you all. And so all of us are able to have access to God through that high priest. And so just oil on the beard, maybe you don't realize how great that is, but the fact that you come before God to recognize this great holy event, that that is what is happening before God. And unity comes from us being able to be holy before God. Then it talks about the dew on Hermon. Hermon was the highest mountain in Israel. So being that high, it got a lot of dew. He says, but even that much falls on little Mount Zion. Because it wasn't very high. But it gets all the dew that Hermon would get. It gets all the blessing of the greatness of God on something that is very small and very weak. And he says, that's what unity is. It's when we have all of this blessing of God on us that should have been designed for something so much bigger, but now is designed for us because we join together in unity. And that's what he's trying to describe. The Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. What a great thing it is, because God recognizes this unity. And so when David writes about this, he writes about the idea of God and about this brothers and about this oil on the beard and about how great this is. And this uncommon unity is really speaking about God. I think our attempts at unity are somewhat different. We try and approach it a lot different. We try to agree, first of all. Can we just make an agreement, maybe a handshake? Well, if that doesn't work, then let's make a contract. And so we want you to sign and date that you will agree to the terms of the contract. Other than that, we're going to put in a law. You don't have to sign and date a law. It's just you're going to get caught if, if you break this law because everything centers around that. And so it's a way for us to have unity. Don't break the law. Everyone obeys. We all have unity, right? No, not at all. What you have is a whole bunch of lawbreakers gathered together. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Or Perhaps we want to do it through compromise. And so let's compromise and we'll get agreement and unity. Not really. It just means nobody got what they wanted. We compromised. And so that's the best we come up with. Or we just redefine the whole thing and say, well, unity is where if you disagree, don't say anything. We have to be unanimous. Have you ever been in those kind of meetings? No matter what decision we make, it's going to be unanimous. And you don't agree. So it means you don't get to talk. 
because we want it to all be unanimous. Well, it isn't unanimous. But that's how we do this. We redefine the whole process. Or we want to say, well, let's promote sameness. Sameness is where all the teens are going to sit in certain inspection. We're even going to hire a special minister just for the teens because none of us want to deal with them. <sighs> Goodness, we, you know, let's put them all over there in their own spot, in their own place, in their own way with a special guy and say, all right, now, because of their sameness, they're all going to have unity and get along. And we extend that. Well, let's do that for college kids as well because they're going to need that. And their sameness creates a unity. Or if maybe with families. We want a family ministry. Well, all right, you can do that. And, and then we've got the widows and all of, all of them that are able to have this widows and special sisters time where they're able to, to quilt, they're able to do things, they're able to have luncheons, they're able to play games, and then the rest of us are just kind of left out. Have you ever noticed that? But we want to promote sameness. As long as we all look the same and we all kind of, you know, don't wear different clothes, we're all going to dress kind of the same, we're not going to stand out too weird, then, then that would be great, wouldn't it? That would be unity. Not at all. You see, that's our common unity and we go through all of those things trying to find people that look like us that think like us that dress like us that have the same political party and that are not going to be too vocal yeah that's always a bad one isn't it boy that almost divides everybody how can we have unity how can this even be possible to have unity well, I think there's a really good way to have that because it's not based on just us and the things that we come up with. Uncommon unity cannot be found in concealing our differences. Uncommon unity is only found when a belief supersedes our differences. It is about something bigger than us. It is about something bigger than what we think it is about something bigger than our age and what we wear and anything that is related to our physical life. That's when we can have unity because it is about something that is so much bigger than just who we are. We tend to go and flock towards sameness. That's not really where unity is found. We become part of something that's bigger. Unity only happens when there is a common cause. And Jesus talks about unity. Well, we looked at David and his idea of unity. Let's look at what Jesus says in his idea of unity. So in John 17, he's in the upper room and he says, I do not ask, he's in a prayer to God. He says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you that may, they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and love me, even as you love, love them, even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given to me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I have made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. So who's Jesus asking about? Well, he's asking about us. I mean, first he prays and he talks about him and his father and about how great it is that they are together. And then he prays for the disciples who are there. And he talks about, you know, they're in the world but not of the world. And, and he's soon to not be of the world at all. And then he talks about the rest. Those of us who are far off, those of us who are going to believe through their word. And so we're able to see that because he talks here about the quality of what all that means. 
He says, you understand, and he's maybe saying this for them as well, you understand how we are one together, that God and Jesus seem to never argue. They don't disagree on anything because Jesus does whatever the Father says. Jesus does whatever the Father wants. And as long as you have it work that way, then it's going to work great. Because Jesus realizes this is where I am. He came for this reason, for this purpose, to be part of who God is. We get that a little bit confused because we want to argue back. So when you had Thanksgiving dinner, did you go to someone else's house or did you have someone over? It usually works one way or the other. So just think about it. If you went to someone else's house, did you say, what, turkey again? We had that last Thanksgiving. Why didn't you have something else? Or if somebody came to your house, did they come in and say, you know, why are we having this? I think we could have eaten a lot earlier. And if they come with that kind of strife and that kind of disagreement, well, it's not going to be too pleasant, is it? Because I'm not sure we're going to get there. You're invited to come. You don't get to argue about it. You're going to eat whatever's there. That's the whole point. God is the one who owns the house. God is the one who has the meal. God is the one who set up everything. We are nothing but guests. You don't get to complain. Now, either you can go and have Thanksgiving, or you can not. That's just it. So, unity is not so much about do I get what I want? That isn't unity. But can I bring myself to be in line with who God is? It is about alignment with God. And I think that's a very important term and a very important way of looking at this. We align ourselves with what God has, with what God wants in order to be one with him. Because you realize he's not changing. We're not getting unity by compromise. We're not getting unity by agreement. We're not getting unity by, you know, us disagreeing but not saying anything. So we just come to, work, to church here and we talk about how great it all is because after all, we all agree, even though we don't like it. You ever heard those mutter under the breath in the pew in front of you? I'm sure not in your pew. No, it's when you bring yourself into line with what God wants and say, then we have unity because God has it all and he's not changing. Guess who has to change in order for unity to take place? It's not going to be him. And the reason there is not unity is because we start the argument. And we don't know exactly how to do all of that. He talks about, I want them to be with me and see where I am. I want them to be able to realize my glory. And, and that's what Jesus talks about with this. The world doesn't know God. They don't understand all of the mercy and grace and blessing that God has for us. And so what a great thing that is. And so this bond of unity that is between Jesus and God. Jesus knows it's God who leads. He is the one. And everything Jesus does is under the Father. And so he invites us to a different kind of unity, to be one with him. To work on the same project, to work on the same goal, to work in the same direction. It's like, I had to take a picture of it, because this is maybe not big enough. It's the biggest one I could find. It's like having a bolt, okay? It has a nut that goes on the bolt. It's a very simple machine. Um, you put the two together, and when you put the two together, it becomes incredibly strong. It becomes one unit. You cannot pull it apart. This is what's holding the building together. This is what's holding the pew you're sitting on. This is what holds the world together is things like this. But it's very difficult at times to be able to get them to work. Because after all, there are two parts. How do you get unity between the two parts? 
doesn't seem to work. We could force it. Oh no, there's threads on it, so we'll twist the threads, right? It's not seeming to work. I'm not sure why. Maybe it's going the wrong direction because threads only go one, one direction, and if you go the wrong direction, then it's not going to work. So what is the problem here? It's still not going to work. I've still got two parts. There's one very, very essential thing that we have to understand with God. It's called alignment. When the two are aligned together, you get unity. When we are not aligned with God, you don't have unity. The problem is us. The problem is we are out of alignment. Some people call it sin. Same thing. Whether we can say, oh, well, that's a big sin or a little sin or any kind of a sin, if you are out of alignment with God, you will not get unity. You will not get what holds you together. You will not get what makes you strong. And it is our alignment with God that gives us that kind of unity. And so I think that's where we come together with him. That's what happens with us. Obedience is the way in which we align ourselves with God, and people then automatically go, oh, no, I don't want to have to obey anybody. Okay, don't obey. The only thing you have to do is align yourself with God. Does that make it easier? You see, that's all it is. We see sin as a big mistake, and we're to blame. Well, the reason for it is being out of alignment. If you align yourself with God and do the will of the Father, it's going to work. But if you're not aligned with God, it's very destructive. Just try driving a car that's out of alignment. You'll eat the tires off of it in just a few thousand miles because your life will not work. It will wobble, it will shimmy, it will pull each way, it will not work. And we wonder what's wrong with our life because the whole thing seems to be jerking and shaking and going and we're, we're trying to do it, God, but you know, I'm trying to do it my way, of course, and get God to bless my life that I want. That's what prayer's for, right? Prayer is to get God to bless what I want so that we can have unity together? I don't think so. Prayer is about you understanding what God's alignment is all about and telling him how that surrender is going to work and how much you appreciate and can glorify him. And that's really what our time is with prayer. There was a church in the New Testament that had all kinds of issues and difficulties. It was called Corinth. As Paul writes to them, 1 Corinthians 1.10, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree that there be no division among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized into the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, and so that no one of you may say you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the house of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not the words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the world... For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And so they were saying, well, I'm of a Paul or Apollos or Terry. Well, nobody says that. I'm of Joshua or Joel or Edison. We could do that, right? We could have different sections. See, which one's the Terry section? 
Oh, yeah, <laughs> I don't have one. <laughs> there she is right there. That's the Terry section. <laughs> but, but, you know, that's what we want. We're all together. We're all in church, and we're all sitting in the same place. We're at least in the same building, but we don't like those people, do we? After all, we know all about them. We know about how bad they are and how terrible they are, and we don't like those people because they don't like us. After all, they're no good over there. They sit clear on the other side. We've got the best place because we don't have to walk very far. We get in the door and we sit down. We don't walk way over there where those people are. We can split and divide over almost anything. And if it's all about who gets their way, that's what happens. But there's a key line in all of this. He says it's not a a tag label with your Christianity. I'm a Terry Christian, a Joshua Christian, a Michael Christian. It's not any of that. I'm not a Democratic Christian, a Republican Christian. I'm not a, a black Christian or a white Christian. I'm an Alaska Christian. It's, it's me and Steve and, you know, the rest of you, I don't know. I, I mean, that's what happens to us. And we put these labels on, we put all these tags on. And he says, no, here it is. Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ should be emptied of its power. The power is in the cross of Christ. That's where it comes from. To us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It unites all of us beyond anything else, beyond any of the labels, beyond any of the tags. Whether we sit on this side or this side, it really doesn't matter, and I shouldn't try to stir up things, should I? <laughs> but that's what happens sometimes with us, and he says, you know, it's not really about that. The solution is the cross of Christ and its power. It's when we focus on one thing. And that's what alignment with God is all about when we are able to see the unity that comes through that cross. And it's in that cross that Jesus unites us. They even thought it was who baptized him. You ever had that? Well, I was baptized by so-and-so, and, -so and he's, he's an important guy. Did it rub off? Did you get better? Uh, so strange for a pre preacher to say, I hope I didn't baptize anybody there so that they don't try to claim, well, they're followers of just him. He says, I want you to know about Christ. It's not in our own eloquence or wisdom. The power is in the cross of Jesus to unite us all. So I want to read something to you that maybe helps us understand. It's from a book by Max Lucado called He Chose the Nails. And so just listen and picture what your relationship is with Christ as you think about his crucifixion. Come with me to the hill of Calvary and I'll tell you why. Watch as soldiers shove the carpenter to the ground and stretch out his arms against the beams. One pressed a knee against a forearm and a spike against a hand. Jesus turns his face toward the nail just as the soldier lifts the hammer to strike it. Couldn't Jesus have stopped him? With a flex of the biceps and a clench of the fist, he could have resisted. Is this not the same hand that stilled the sea, cleansed the temple, summoned the dead? But the fist doesn't clench. And the moment isn't aborted. And the mallet rings and the skin rips and the blood begins to drip. And then the question follow. Why? Why didn't Jesus resist? Because he loves us, we reply. And that is true, wonderfully true. But forgive me, only, only partially true. There is more to his reason. He saw something that made him stay. And as the soldier pressed his arm and Jesus rolls his head to the side and as his cheek resting on the wood, he saw a mallet, yes. A nail, yes. A soldier's hand, 
Yes. But he saw something else. A long list. A list of our mistakes, our lusts and lies and greedy moments and prodigal years. A list of our sins. Dangling from the cross is an itemized catalog of your sins. The bad decisions from last year, the bad attitudes from last week, there in broad daylight for all of heaven to see, is a list of your mistakes. The list God has made, however, cannot be read. The words can't be deciphered. The mistakes are covered. The sins are hidden. He has forgiven all your sins. He has utterly wiped out the written evidence of broken commandments which always hung over our heads and has completely annulled it by nailing it to a cross. And that's why he refused to close his fist. He knew the source of those sins was you. And since he couldn't bear the thought of eternity without you, he chose the nails. The hand squeezing the handle was not a Roman infantryman. The force behind the hammer was not an angry mob. The verdict behind the death was not decided by jealous Jews. Jesus himself chose the nails. So the hand of Jesus opened up. Had the soldier hesitated, Jesus himself would have swung the mallet. So Jesus himself swung the hammer. The same hand that still the sea stills your guilt. The same hand that cleansed the temple cleanses your heart. And as the hands of Jesus that opened for the nail also opened the door of heaven for you. And he would unite us all under God. Because what he does is give his blood for our forgiveness. We do things that divide us. We get angry and we're frustrated and we fight and we say things and we leave things out and we don't communicate. And sometimes it's on purpose because we're a little upset. You see, it's very uncommon to love as much as Jesus loves. It's very uncommon to sacrifice as much as he sacrifices. But put it all in his hand because a nail gets driven into that hand. A nail through every sin so that it can't escape the cross. That's what Jesus does for us. That's what draws us. That's what holds us together. You see, if we were all playing instruments together, and we had this great orchestra, and we needed to tune, and so we said, all right, everybody likes Lois, so let's all tune to Lois's. But it's only Lois and her little group here that people want to tune to. And everybody likes Jack. I mean, as weird as he is, everybody likes Jack. He can't play a thing, but we're going to tune to Jack on this side because, after all, we like Jack, and he's a good guy. And so we're going to tune to that. Now, Justin back there has the right tune, and so some people are going to tune to Justin, and he's going to have the right tune. And some people just think Dallas is so smart, so they're going to tune up with Dallas. And then if we try to play all of this music together, even though we've got the same music, what's going to happen? It's going to sound pretty bad. Because we all tune to the wrong thing. But you see, if one person has a tuning fork, and all of us tune to that one tuning fork, then we'll all be on the same page. Justin does that when he comes up and he blows the sound. Did you know that means get in tune with that? Some of you I'm not so sure about. You know, but that's what that's for is to say, here's the pitch, here's the tune, here's the 
music. And we're all called to be uncommon. And we don't dance to our own music. Jesus has written our song. And we are united in his cross. And all of us have been forgiven and received grace and mercy and redemption. And all of us have been saved. And all of us have been buried with him in baptism. It's a link to his blood. At least, I think. If you haven't been, then is your life out of unity with Christ? If you haven't received grace and forgiveness and mercy and redemption and you pass that on to so many other people, are, are you still fighting it? Are you one unit with him so that you hold together strong and firm? You know he's got your life. You know he's got your back. You notice the picture, Jesus isn't there. Those are the things he left behind. He left behind nails and a cross and a crown and his blood, but he's gone to heaven. He's gone to a better place. And if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will also be united in a resurrection like his. A new home, a new life, a holy place, filled with his spirit. Are you united with Christ? So that not only do you share in the horror of his death and that his blood cleanses you, but are you ready to share in the glory of his life because he now sits in heaven at the right hand of the throne of God. I urge you today, be united with Christ. Would you come while we stand and sing?